Hello everyone, this is Scott Bissell from the Center for Faculty Excellence and today's webinar is Capstone Intensive's Quick Start for Faculty. And uh, leading our webinar today will be Dr. Gary Burkholder, who is a faculty member of both the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and the College of Health Sciences. And Gary has a great deal of experience to share um, as being a faculty member at several of our Capstone Intensives. Um, so I'll be turning things over to him shortly. We also have a couple of other representatives who support uh, residencies and capstones at the university. We have uh, Dr. Lori Beppert, who is our faculty specialist that supports academic residencies. And then we also have uh, the director of academic residencies, Dr. Malika Ingram, and the associate director of, Dr. of academic residencies, Dr. Rochelle Gilbert, uh, who are also here with us today. So welcome to them and welcome to you. Um, and thanks for being with us today. Before I turn things over to Gary to go through the content and the um, discussion we have for today's session, I want to just do a quick overview of how to use the GoToWebinar controls to ensure you're able to fully participate. You should be seeing the full control panel that I'm showing on the left side of my PowerPoint screen uh, over on the right side for you. If you're not and you're seeing just the collapsed view of the control panel, all you have to do is just click the arrow and once you do that, the full control panel will return back to you. There may be times when you want to click that arrow again to have the control panel be a minimized view in case there's an text that can be blocking the control panel. So you can switch back and forth between this view and the minimized view. If you've not already done so, you may want to just click the audio setup link to make sure your speakers and microphone are working properly with GoToWebinar to ensure you can uh, fully participate. Uh, when you're doing the audio setup test, uh, the audio will not come through when you're testing your microphone, so you won't hear it in the uh, classroom. There's a couple ways you can participate today. First way is through the questions box. If you want to send your questions in via text, all you have to do is just type in your question, and then uh, the question will come to us, and we will review um, your question and return, uh, get back to you. Um, and if it's a question or a thought that might be benefit for the whole group, uh, we'll share that at the next um, time. The other way you can participate is through using the microphone um, on your computer or your telephone and participate via audio. All you have to do is just click that raise hand button that I have boxed now, and when we pause for questions or um, comments, we will unmute you so you can share your thoughts. We have put all of our attendees in the muted mode uh, right now for your uh, sound settings, just to cut down on any background noise uh, so that you're able to clearly hear the presenters today. Uh, if you're having any technical support uh, and can't get uh, this through to us through the questions area, you can also call the go to web webinar technical support team at the phone number you see on the screen. Also, we will have an evaluation link at the end of the webinar in the questions area for you to provide your feedback. Also over in the questions area right now, we do have a link to closed captioning. Um, if you would like to participate in the webinar that way, all you have to do is just click on the link that you see for closed captioning, and our closed captioner is um, <coughs> captioning as we continue along. So that's just a quick overview of how to use GoToWebinar, and now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Gary Burkholder, who's going to lead us through our session today. Gary? Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, well, I'm, I'm really pleased to be uh, able to talk to you about this. Um, this sort of idea um, was conceived a few years ago, um, and we, I worked closely with the residencies team, and I was actually associated with residencies then, um, uh, to develop this kind of an experience where students could come in and get more intensive work on their, uh, on their capstone proposals. And we started this out with the uh, dissertation, and so if you if you hear me refer to dissertation students or PhD, it's because my, uh, my experience with this has been with the doctoral or with the PhD students. So um, it's not to, to diss any other program. We have uh, capstone experiences now uh, in various programs. Um, so anyway, so, <clears throat> so uh, again, what this is is these, these students come in uh, into a, a hotel, uh, essentially, and we ask them to uh, pay for the hotel and uh, breakfast and lunch. And what they do is they sequester, uh, we want them to sequester and just to be able to focus on writing. So we ask them to sort of step out of their current environments and just come to a place where they can think and create and write uh, based on, uh, on their capstone um, research questions. And so um, a number of uh, attendees, or they come at various stages and with, um, with a number of um, 
uh, issues related to their work. So, you know, where are they? Uh, we've had some students who come in and are at the proposal stage and they can't, they just can't get past the URR, so they want some um, focused attention on that. We have several who come in who've been working on the proposal for, for many years, that's the report, and they don't seem to really be getting anywhere and recognize that they need to really um, start making progress. And once in a while, we also do get some students who come in who have finished through the proposal and are just using the opportunity to work on, on chapters four and five. Um, next slide, please. So, so uh, the outcomes for these, uh, these experiences are, are the outcomes for this particular session is um, to talk about the program structure of these capstone intensives, and it's pretty much the same across uh, any of the programs. And, and I want to spend a lot of time talking on what the faculty does during that, and then identify strategies for successful advising sessions. Again, I've done several of these now um, over the past three years. Uh, and, and have seen probably a wide range of students. So as we're going through this, and if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to um, let me know. So next slide. Um, okay, and uh, so the agenda, I think we talked about the, the, uh, the program structure, faculty role, uh, what we do on the first day when we first get the students um, together with the faculty and the writing center person, um, how we structure the advising sessions, uh, and then additional resources. So uh, next slide, please. So this is a little bit of an overview um, about the program structure. So uh, again, it's a, it's a four-day experience, and it really mirrors what, we've, what we're doing right now with the, the PhD residencies, where they come in on a Wednesday afternoon, uh, and then they're there until Sunday noon. And, um, and, and we have a Blackboard classroom that's available for the students. Um, that, that they, once they register for this experience, they're registered into it, and they have access to uh, a number of resources, and I'll bring those up uh, periodically during this uh, presentation. We ask that the students bring 25 articles with them as resources that they can use to write. Uh, and we, you know, some students come with a suitcase full of paper articles, uh, some come with their laptops and just have them on there, but we just we really emphasize this because we want students to come there and write. And again, we know that some of them have not been as productive in writing as they want to. Uh, and so this sort of will help them to make best use of their time there. Um, generally, these, um, these um, uh, intensives are, are maxed out at between 20 and 21 students. Um, and the idea is that we have a fairly low uh, faculty to student ratio. Uh, and so generally, we try with the faculty and the writing center staff um, to have it about uh, around a one to seven uh, ratio. And the faculty that we, that we bring there and that are assigned there generally, um, they, are, they can do research across different kinds of approaches and methodologies. Um, we always do make sure that we can cover quantitative and qualitative uh, at every session. But again, I would say that most of our faculty who go there are pretty well versed in quantitative, qualitative, and mixed and can work with students um, fairly equally well across the, the three different kinds of main uh, methodologies. The main, and, we, and we tell the students that the main focus there is writing. Uh, we're not there to teach them anything really about content. It's really, um, and I'll talk a little bit about how the, the structured sessions are held each day, uh, but it's really to, to focus them on, on how to get them oriented again into, uh, into writing and and what they should be writing to. Um, each morning of that for the, uh, uh, well, I'll call it day two, day three, and day four, um, we spend uh, about two hours each of the morning talking about the checklist um, and what kinds of content that they need to have inside of each of the chapters of their proposal. So we go through that with them and make sure that, uh, that it's covered. Um, and then students uh, complete a survey after the intensive. We collect, try to collect some information um, about their experience. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of, in terms of the basic logistics, um, the residency office um, takes care of a lot of this. You know, it's, it, again, it's, the students register for this um, similar to how they would register for a residency experience. It's on the Walden um, website. Uh, the residency office will work to set up the Blackboard classroom. Um, again, it's, it's, it's kind of like the residency classroom in that it's really more about resources 
Um, and there are some opportunities there if people want to um, do discussions. But the residency office takes care of that piece. Um, the events team will send any of the ancillary materials um, to the site. Uh, and those materials include things like name tags uh, or table tents. Um, and they also work to provide um, information for the students on things like restaurants that are in the area, um, uh, anything about transportation, uh, where hospital, pharmacy, and those kind of things are so that the students have a sense of, uh, you know, where they can go to eat and, and those kind of things. So the events team, they, they, they scope out these areas and they take care of all of that um, for us in, in advance. And they also work to make sure that there's um, adequate space at the hotel, there's projector, and there's whiteboard and markers. So again, all the typical stuff that you might find um, at a residency. And, and so again, uh, the, the residency's team works with um, with the departments to assign um, faculty members um, to teach at the at the capstone intensives, and there at every every capstone there's always a writing center staff who's there assigned to that, and and that staff is used in in different ways. Um, primarily, that staff member is there to advise students with writing, uh, and they will teach sessions or teach a piece of the of the overall presentation that deals specifically with writing. Um, sometimes we have a writing center. Um, uh, folks there who have doctorates and are, are well versed in research and so in those cases they also serve as, um, as, as uh, can help the students with uh, research methodology issues. So essentially when you when you show up on site everything should be all taken care of uh, and in general the front desk will give you a packet of information um, from the events team but everything should be all set to go and just another thing about logistics we have um, generally in the past and as part of the price um, included the, the breakfast and lunch and, and dinner on their own. Um, next please. Okay, so here's a daily structure. So um, in, the, in, the, in the first day, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the first day, we only meet for two hours in the afternoon and the idea of that is just to do um, introductions and again I'll talk about that um, in a second. Um, days two, three, and four are full days and what we do is each of, oops, each of the mornings is spent on um, is spent on covering one of the chapters in the capstone. So, uh, so for example, and I'm, again, I'm going to speak in this case from the, the PhD, is that we would cover um, uh, chapter two, the literature review part, and we would walk through the checklist and and, ex and describe to students, explain to them what kinds of things we expect in each of those sections. So again, it's really about clarity around what we want in terms of, of, of structure um, of that. And so we do that for uh, usually a couple of hours and then after that the rest of the day is focused on writing and advising. And so um, we set up 30 minute um, individual advising sessions and uh, you know we, we give ourselves lunch off but generally we would meet then from whenever that session ends until 5 o'clock and we'd be meeting with students um, and advising with them um, students are, are, you know, we suggest to students that if they want, um, they can they can sit and they can write sort of in the common area. And a lot of students like to have others around them to do that. Um, some students like to just go back to the peace and quiet of their hotel room. Uh, whatever it is, um, they write and they signed up to meet with um, with one of the faculty members or the writing center um, person. And then at the end of each day, what we do is we have what we call a check-in, and it's check-in on the progress of where students are and how they're doing. So, um, so we ask the students to report on, you know, any, um, you know, any successes of the day and any kind of barriers uh, that they might have had to productive writing and share that with the group. Um, and, and also in some ways to, to set goals um, for what they want to accomplish for the next day. And that's generally, and, and each day two and day three and day four uh, are all structured the same way. On the last day, which is a half day, um, we'll, the, the, the morning is set up for advising and at 11 o'clock we have what we call our final check-in where, uh, where students talk about their experience overall and we, we try to encourage them to commit to some kind of a, of a plan once they leave uh, the, the capstone intensive. So the next uh, slide please. Hmm. Um, Sorry, did we miss the um, the one about the, the first day check-in? Maybe we. Um, so let, let me let me just. Uh, I thought we had a first day check-in. So um, on the first day, what we do um, with the students is we bring them in, uh, have them uh, come in at four o'clock, 
and we go around and we ask the students to uh, to talk about uh, we the faculty introduce themselves first and what their areas of expertise are and then we have the students go around and introduce themselves and just you know where they're from and, and we really wanted them to get into what program they're in what kinds of um, uh, what kind of experience they've had up to that point and what they're struggling with and what they'd like to see as the outcome for that experience. And that's where, uh, where you really get a sense pretty quickly about the wide variety of places where students are. And, um, and it's, it's quite amazing, actually, uh, when, you, when, you see, when you see the diversity and the, and the places where people are in the, of the process, um, how well that tends to work for everybody. Uh, and everybody kind of really quickly in the intensive um, finds their own niche. Um, and, and, and for the most part, I would say students leave there uh, generally feeling like they've, they've met um, what they've wanted to. Um, so, so let me talk a little bit about the, the, the faculty role. So we, I, I talked about in the morning the faculty members will do the presentation around the checklist and what kinds of things um, should be in there. And that's all a structured PowerPoint presentation that's already been created, so it's not something that the instructor has to create, and it's part of the Blackboard classroom. So I, I think what makes the, the dissertation or the capstone intensive really unique is, is, is the faculty role and how much more tends to be demanded of the faculty here than it would in a typical uh, residency experience. So faculty members have to be able to work with students who are at various stages of proposal development, and that that ranges from, we have some students who are just starting their, um, their first dissertation course. Um, and they're there because they want to just make sure they launch off on the right foot. And then we have people who, as I indicated before, who've been struggling for a long time and can't seem to make progress. Um, we get some people who've been in there for, to, in the proposal stage for two or three years and haven't really done anything. So, so uh, the faculty member needs to be able to to quickly uh, react to and meet the student where they're at, uh, where the student is at in his or her own um, proposal development. And again, so what you end up doing um, when you have these sessions is you end up turning on and turning off very quickly and shifting sometimes between students who are at the beginning of the stage versus the end of the stage and somebody who has a, uh, a dissertation that's not in your content area of expertise. So. Um, it, it really does require a lot of um, cognitive shifting. Um, also, ranges of student ability. And, you know, we, we've, we've, all of us have probably taught here for a while. We know that the students that come to us, they're not all, they're not all, um, they're not all scholars. They're not all researchers, expert researchers. And so you do um, get the range of students who are, are really struggling versus those who um, seem to have a handle on it um, but need other kinds of assistance. So to be able to work with that kind of a range of students. And then I mentioned just briefly, and, and just to reemphasize that in the, in the capstone experience, um, you're likely going to be working with students who are, are doing research that's not in your discipline. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, um, and one of the things that we try to reinforce with students is that, um, that we're not there to, uh, to talk about content, uh, about their specific content, but we can help them really with the logic of their dissertations and their dissertation proposals because of our, uh, because of our expertise. Um, I'm sorry, one second. Um, this happens, and I don't know why. Sorry, I have to shift my screen just a little bit because I, I, I end up with this big uh, when my screen goes black, I end up with this big thing on the front and it's covering, so I just need to move it over a little bit so I can make sure I cover everything. Um, and then faculty also need to be comfortable with the, with, the, with the structure of the capstone. So this is really important also. This is not the place to, uh, for the faculty member to come in and say, well, um, you, know, we, you know, this is what we ask for, but you can sort of cut corners here, and, or I don't agree with you know, what we ask for in this particular part. Uh, we ask all the faculty members, and we, we, we ask for consistency in this, that, that everybody teach what is required by the university. So for the PhD um, students, that's the dissertation checklist. That's the, that's the university standard. And the, for the EDD, DBA programs, CAM, they all have their own kinds of standard documents that, uh, that teach from. So uh, again, we prepare that curriculum for you to deliver, uh, but you as a faculty member need to be very comfortable 
with the, with the checklist or the or the rubric and what's being asked that you can convey that uh, a lot of times with examples to the students. And then, um, and then uh, again, the faculty members will conduct individual 30-minute advising sessions um, during the day after um, the presentation. And then at the end of the day, and I talked about this, is that the, um, the, the faculty members will facilitate the, the group check-in. And it's also a good time for the faculty members to provide um, some of their own insight uh, and some of the themes that they're seeing to help really uh, inspire the students uh, and to, to keep them moving forward. Okay, uh, next. So required, uh, required materials and content and preparation. So the faculty members, it is expected that, that just like in the residency that you visit the Blackboard classroom, um, download the PowerPoint presentation, um, and then also um, be really familiar with the supporting documentation. There's some great um, tools that are, that are in the classroom. For example, some examples on how to synthesize literature. There's some uh, the literature review matrix. There's some really kind of handy things that the students could find useful that many times as a faculty member I, um, I advise um, students to consider and the students usually find helpful. So just to be aware of what's um, in there. Um, students, again, they come with their 25 articles. Um, we ask them to, to, to make sure that they come to the, the intensive with their most current draft ready to share with the faculty member. Um, and then um, students visit the Blackboard classroom to get all, all the same materials. Um, that the faculty member does. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, okay, the first day meeting uh, introduction, uh, we, we already went through this, so we can go on the next slide. Um, this is, again, the first day starts at 4 o'clock. Um, and then, and then uh, just a couple things on that first day meeting. We do provide an overview of the intensive structure, and, and the faculty, as a faculty member, uh, I really use this opportunity to reinforce to the students uh, the expectations for the experience. You know, I, 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 I use the time to, to remind them that we don't want them spending their afternoon taking business calls or, or dealing with family issues and those kind of things. And it's the reason why we have them stay uh, in the hotel because um, we really, really want them to write. So we, um, we drive that point home uh, to them over and over again that it's about writing and making the most of that um, experience. And another thing that I, I, I would say that we remind the students frequently, and it's something to keep in mind, is that as the facilitators of the capstone experience, we are not, um, we are not members of the students' committee in most cases. I, I've had some of my own students attend them. But for the most part, we're not a member of that committee. And, and it's important to reinforce to students that the capstone instructors don't replace the committee and they don't override any of the committee's decisions. We, uh, I kind of view myself as a consultant, um, in a sense, where I'm helping the students, um, you know, from a from a structure standpoint, from a logic standpoint, from a methodology standpoint, um, to make to take steps forward, um, and and to do that. But but you know, sometimes a student might say, "Well, my faculty chair said this," and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I and and we reinforce the student: we're not the chair. Those are decisions that they. Uh, the committee and the student will have to make the final decision on that, that we can only be there as guides. Um, Gary? Okay. Yes? Oh, we have a question from Karen. Um, and Karen is wondering if students are grouped by PhD, EDD, et cetera, or are there different capstones held for each area? Um, that's a good question. There, there are different capstones for each area. So um, sometimes they're co-located, but the PhD students are all together with their own faculty. EDD students, DBA students, they're all, they're, they're, they're separate and they run separate sessions. Sometimes, depending on the size, the writing center person may, may handle um, a, a couple of different um, uh, uh, sessions, a couple of different um, program areas uh, and overlap, you know, for small residencies, but, but everything is taught separately. Thank you, Gary. Yep. So I talked a little bit about the advising and what we do, but I want to I want to dig into this because this advising um, structure is really probably one of the most important aspects of the of the the intensive experience. You know, we're used to residencies where the sessions are 15 or 20 minutes. Here they're 30 minutes, and it was designed that way because we want to make sure that students have maximum opportunity to interact with faculty and have more time 
to dig in and develop some of the thoughts and ideas that maybe they weren't able to, or they wouldn't be able to in a smaller session. So they're all 30-minute sessions. We ask, um, we ask that students uh, bring something with them to the session, or we invite them also to send it to us in advance if they want to. Uh, we can't read an entire proposal, but uh, what we'll do is we'll ask the student if they want to send something in advance, focus us on what they'd like to look at and what they'd like to talk about in the session, and then, and then we will uh, make the effort to, to try to look at it in advance. And usually for me, it's never been a problem. Um, to just, you know, if I, as long as I have enough information from the student, I can do that. And what it does is it really makes us more, more useful and more beneficial to, um, to the students and, and more helpful to them in the long run. So sometimes, sometimes students come there and they don't have, uh, they don't even have a draft to start with because they haven't started writing. And so maybe in that first advising session, uh, and that goes into bullet three here, where we help the student articulate the goal, that we help the student to create a goal and maybe uh, and one of the common goals that I set for students is if they don't have anything written, then what I would like them to leave is at least an outline of each of the three chapters with a little bit of, um, I call it a detailed outline. It has a little bit of the meat um, of the kinds of things that they will be talking about in each one of the sections of the, of the capstone rubric related to their own study. So we, again, we, we constantly focus the students on on, on being productive and, and setting goals and meeting those goals. Um, faculty, of course, you know, and I, I, do, I use this all the time. We bring our laptop to the session. Um, many of you, uh, from the experience that you have, um, you might have uh, resources that would be helpful for the students. Um, you know, I'm in the library with students a lot, looking for specific things, uh, helping the students with search terms if they're getting stuck or things that I know. So. You know, and all the, of course, all the hotels have, you have access to the internet, so uh, that becomes a key resource. And then, um, and then always ending the session uh, with just a quick discussion about, you know, what they're going to do after that and, and what, what, we'll, what we'll be taking a look at the next day. So again, these sessions are so, uh, so important, um, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about some of the stress that comes from that, too, but from a student perspective, these are critical. And it's really funny. One of the things I notice is the students, even with three faculty or three people, two faculty in a writing center, they'll go through and sign up, and they'll say, "Wow, I, I ran out of spaces." Uh, and what happens in the first day? Everybody wants to sign up for everything, um, but then, but then what happens is very quickly students um, erase section sections um, and get to the point where they come and see somebody if they need the person and, and write otherwise. So. Uh, I've, I've never been in a situation where uh, we've run out of advising time or students felt like they were under-advised uh, at, that, at that faculty to student ratio. Uh, next section or next slide. Okay, so here's, the, this is also very important, strategies with dealing with students. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, again, is to expect that the students are going to be at different stages of research development. Um, if, if, you're a, if you're a person who's not comfortable um, with, with dealing with, um, with beginning students um, or not comfortable with dealing with more advanced students, um, th this may not be the right experience. Um, it's really, really important um, that you be able to be flexible um, uh, and, and know that students, students may be in different stages, but also uh, not just different stages again, but different, um, different um, uh, uh, Different, uh, different places uh, in terms of ability related to research and preparation that they have. So very, very important to keep that in mind. Um, you have to be able, in that, in that short time, you've got to be able to quickly um, assess the student's need and help them to really quickly, in the first five minutes of that session, help them to focus on what would be most beneficial to them. So, uh, so you need to be able to, to be engaged with the student and be able to, uh, to make those kinds of decisions. Another thing is recognizing when to get the chair involved. This doesn't happen very often, um, but once in a while, you may be in a situation where the student um, is being combative or argumentative in some way, or uh, what's the only one time that I've had to get involved with a chair, the student was doing something that I felt, um, and I talked with my colleagues, that we felt was um, very unethical and would never get approved. Um, is research, and so we finally, and the student was kind of stuck on that, so uh, I needed to contact the chair and just let the chair know what our concerns were um, in that. 
So, so um, and, and you're not going to get the chair involved uh, in everything. Um, again, uh, you, our, our role is not as a member of the committee, but just to guide the students and be consultants to the students. Um, and also, um, you need to be prepared with students who, who have a number of different issues. You know, I've been in, I've been in sessions, uh, opening day sessions, where students have started crying. Um, some students have just been so frustrated by the process and been in it so long that they, they feel like they're at wit's end. And so you're going to, you're going to get some of those um, kinds of students. Um, uh, and, and, you, and you need to be able to deal with them and you need to be able to, to be empathetic uh, and, and to show empathy with the students and try to come from the student's perspective and help the student to figure out how to best um, address it uh, and, and give the student hope, if you will. Um, uh, of, of making good progress, uh, particularly after the, um, after the intensive is over. Um, we already talked about that you're providing consultation and not replacing the committee, um, and then making sure to understand, and it's really not just understanding the documents in Blackboard, but it's really having a good grasp of what kinds of resources are available for students uh, who are writing their dissertations. Um, my experience is the people that that have been, uh, that have been um, the really great instructors at the capstone experiences, uh, number one, that they're, they're good and they understand research, uh, but also that they come well-versed um, in and have a experience working with students in dissertations and, and can really point students in the right direction. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm assuming that Lori will stop me if I, any more questions come up. I haven't seen anything. so. Um, uh, instructor self-care tips. This is this is this is really important because one of the things that that I, I just got I'll just state right off the top is that this this experience it's it's called intensive for a reason. <laughs> it's intensive for the students in terms of writing, but it can be very very taxing for the faculty members because you are you're essentially teaching for two hours or so in the morning. And then you're meeting with students. Uh, again, you're having to turn your brain on and off. You're having to shift direction. You're having to shift out of your comfort zone, maybe. You're doing that then up until 5 o'clock. And so by the end of the day, uh, you're usually pretty tired. Um, and and, um, and so, so some things that, that I would suggest um, about taking care of yourself is uh, avoid taking, uh, taking on the student problems and keep ownership with the student. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 it would be easy to sort of get um, kind of caught up into there, I guess, and, and sometimes you hear the word codependent, uh, where, you, where we want to make that problem and, and sort of take it and really help the student and, and take that problem from the student and try to help the or try to figure it out for the student. And it's really being able to stay objective uh, while being empathetic at the same time. Um, empower them to, to be active. Um, um, proponents or active um, um, participants in the solution to their own problems. And again, remembering that you're consultants to the committee. Uh, as soon as you feel yourself talking like a committee member, um, it's, pro it's probably a good um, sign that you should uh, that maybe you should take a step back and 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 take on more of a consultative role than a committee member role. Um, and recognize what's what's within your control and where you can help. Um, I think I think that's the biggest thing we're working with students is 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 to to be helpful. Um, but again, um, you know, if 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 you need to go outside for guidance, um, you should feel free to do that. Um, use the um, your your other faculty member there. Uh, I, I constantly have discussions with the other faculty member that's with me or faculty members to talk through some of the things that are coming up and decide if I need to um, how we could best deal with it so that I don't feel like I'm owning all of that um, myself. Um, again, feel free to reach out to the chair or program director when you deem appropriate. I would say that this should happen very rarely um, and only in the most, um, the most uh, extreme circumstances. Uh, be very careful about working through lunch or past 5 o'clock. I, I, there was a faculty member once who um, thought that he needed to have sessions into the, into the nighttime hours. And, um, it's, it's, it's way too exhausting. So you really need to, to give yourself time and space to kind of just be by yourself and decompress a little bit. So, you know, I, I do work through lunch sometimes, but I never work past 5 o'clock. I just, um, by that time of the day, I'm usually too tired 
and, and it's really about going back, resting, doing my own work, and then coming back, being able to come back the next day fresh. Uh, and I think that's the important thing is you need to be able to come back each morning fresh and ready to go again and not frustrated. Um, and, then, and then remember that you may not be a content expert, but you're an expert in doctoral research. And that's really what the students are looking for. The students don't, they, they, they usually pick up pretty quickly that you don't know their content area, but they're relying on you and leaning on you and looking to you to, to ask for guidance about how to structure uh, and write their dissertations in terms of the methodology, the logical approach, et cetera. And uh, anybody who's trained at the doctoral level should be able to, to, to be able to work with any student um, at that level. And that's really what the students are looking for. So the, the, the big bottom line takeaway from this slide is, as a faculty member, um, take care of yourself, um, keep good boundaries, um, and, don't, uh, and don't, don't, don't work yourself way into the night every night. You're going you're to burn out yourself. And burnout in this kind of a setting uh, is really easy if you don't take care of yourself. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so at this point um, we have a, we have two or three um, uh, scenarios here, and it's just an opportunity for you to um, either I guess use the chat bar or or raise your hand um, about some situations that might come up and some ideas that you have for how to deal with it. And so, and and these are the the three scenarios that are coming up are all ones that do come up at these capstone intensives. Um, and so the first one is the defense what we call the defensive students, and then. Um, and then it, it's, um, a, a, it's a student tells you that something that you told them is not what the chair said, and what the student, and, but, but you know that what the student's saying is clearly incorrect. So in, in that case, what would you do? Okay. And as, as Gary said, if you want to click the raise hand button, if you want to share using your microphone, or send your uh, questions in via or your thoughts in via text. Um, looks like we already have one hand raised, um, and I'll just give everyone just another minute to think about this uh, before okay. we go ahead and start the discussion. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start with Kathleen Lynch. Kathleen, I've unmuted you. Go ahead and share your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I would use the... Um, the dissertation or the capstone document itself, um, and ask the um, the student to um, you know locate the part of the document that um, demonstrates that um, you know what they're saying is what the chair told them to do that. Um, the um, that you know what I'm saying is not correct, and that way um, we're shifting the discussion off of people and onto um, an an issue that is about the um, the dissertation or the research itself, and um, we can kind of try to untie the knot rather than talking about who's right and who's wrong. That's a great point, Kathleen. Thanks. Okay. It, it, it's really it's it's going back to the objective. You know, here's what here's what you know. This is our university document that you follow, and and really following with that. Okay. All right. Uh, Gary uh, Sarah wrote in um, and writes that she would ask the student to reclarify what he said and provide examples. Maybe there's a misunderstanding rather than wrongness. Yep. Absolutely. Something else that, uh, another example that comes up sometimes, and, and I don't know where these things get propagated, but we'll have a student that says, well, uh, my chair told me that I, that I have to have at least 100 citations in my chapter two, <laughs> you know, or 100, 100 references. And, uh, and, and I think that it's, you know, it's a good thing to go back and, and look at our rubric and you can say, well, you know, that would, and what, what you and your chair work out is, is up to you. Um, but we're going by is the rubric, and the rubric doesn't provide any any mandatory uh, requirement for that. And so, and and we do also say that a lot of times students and chairs will make up well, will come to their own agreements uh, and their own arrangements on things. Um, and so, and that way, we stay out of that um, the conversation. 
All right, it uh, looks like we have one more person. Uh, Melanie writes in, um, how about working with the student to clarify the issue as, issue as Sarah suggested, and then ask the student to email his or her chair that evening to share what he or she is learning and discussing at the in intensive? That's a, that's, a great, that's a great point, and we actually do that sometimes. You know, we'll encourage the student, and, 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 and actually that's one of the things we encourage the students at the beginning, that if they want to be in contact with their chairs during this experience, we, we really we encourage them to do that and that way uh, and we have asked students or students will come and they'll say um, sometimes their chair lives in the area so they might meet with them but they'll say well I'm going to I'm going to give my uh, after our meeting we'll say why don't you contact the chair and discuss what we talked about um, and then the student will indeed go and have the conversation with the chair and I would say in almost every case that works out beautifully so I think that's a great suggestion okay. it also helps reinforce with the student that we're not there to replace the committee, but there we're, we're there as, an, as, a, as a consultant or a helper. Okay, looks like we um, have everyone's uh, thoughts in. Gary, would you like to move to the next? Sure. One? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. This is, this one happens. Um, I won't say a lot, but it does. It's, it happens with some frequency. The student complains about the chair uh, or the committee member and. You know, the student might sit down with you and, and start complaining that, you know, the chair never gets back to them or um, are they, they want, uh, they, the, they're not getting enough support from the chair. Sometimes they'll ask you if you can be their chair. Um, how would you handle a situation like that? Give you all just a uh, ten seconds or so more to think about this one, or send your response in. And remember too, you can also click the raise hand button if you want to share your thoughts uh, out loud with the group. All right. Well, we have one response in uh, so far, Gary. Um, Sarah writes in. I would ask the student if they have reached out to the chair and or followed the procedures in the semester plan for addressing concerns. Um, also, she would empathize, empathize with the student first and emphasize the response time at Walden. Some students have unrealistic expectations. Okay, good. I, I, you know, I think, um, I think one of the things there about, and it's particularly important about encouraging the student to reach out to the chair is, uh, is another good one. Um, you know, um, I, I do, and I do bring up actually that we do have, um, sort of um, service level agreements, if you will, or we have response time uh, uh, expectations. Um, and, uh, you know, we know in the, in the capstone courses now, uh, for most of them, they're in a dissertation or, or a capstone shell where they have opportunities to reach out to the chair, and it is expected that the chairs will uh, communicate with the students. And so, you know, one of the things that I will, I would do, that I have done, actually, is to really talk with the student and help encourage them to, to feel more like um, taking, that they should own their own research process. So, so I, I might suggest to the student, you know, ask the student, did you read, have you, have you talked to your chair about what you need? And, and I'll say, you know, different students need different things and different chairs have different expectations as well. And so, you know, it's, it's really important for the student to reach out to the chair um, also, and, and sort of say, you know, have, a, have another conversation even at this stage of the game and say, here are the kind of things that I need um, to feel like I'm being supported and to move forward. And so it's, a, it's an opportunity for the chair and the students to have a negotiation. I think sometimes that I find that students at these intensives um, don't feel empowered to be able to, to have those conversations with the chair. So we spend a lot of time uh, encouraging students to do that. So I think contacting the chair is probably one of the key uh, strategies here. Yeah. Um, and, and Melanie actually wrote in a similar suggestion um, that maybe well, we could ask students whether they have specified the kind of support that they need and perhaps, perhaps yeah. a student might benefit by a telephone call um, but might feel awkward or unavailable to make that request. Um, so it could be a perception. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Right on. Okay. Uh, Kathleen writes in, um, uh, refocusing the student on the purpose of the re of the intensive and encouraged communication with the chair. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that, 
And, and, and that's exactly right. We, we use this opportunity to, to, to do exactly that, to say, you know, we're here to consult with you, um, but here are some things that you can do um, to, to, to kind of help that out. And, you know, we, we encourage students also there if they want to, you know, again, to, to reach out and, and be in contact with their chairs during this process. And, you know, I, I know that anecdotally, I've heard from a couple of students, at least after the intensives are over, that have reported, um, and of course you don't hear the ones that don't, but the ones that, that wrote back and said that they had those conversations with the chair and it turned out to be like one of the best things that they had done because it allowed them to, to reestablish that connection and to, to set some, to, and it's really about, and what we tell the students is about setting mutual expectations, not just demanding that this is what I want out of you. But, but how can we best work together to meet, uh, to meet the needs of my research? Okay, all right. Uh, you want to I'm just, I'm just looking at a couple more points I, I wanted to. Sure, um, go ahead. Or at least one is, um, is one of the things that we definitely stay away from there is any conversation about, about you potentially becoming the student's chair. Um, I, I don't know that that happens, but I know residencies yeah, I, I've been there enough to know that it's really easy to, in the residency setting, to say, oh yeah, I'll consider being your chair. Um, but, but really, um, this kind of a setting is very different. So to keep that, you need to keep boundaries. And, you know, that's something that probably after the experience, you know, if you, if you reach out to the student, that's one thing. But during the dissertation intensive, particularly because the emotions are so high, um, that it's better to just not entertain those conversations um, at all. And also, uh, not telling the student what you would do if you were the student's chair. Uh, that, that, in a sense, um, can set up a conversation where it sounds like you're volunteering to be the chair or is making the current chair look, um, maybe to the student, look worse than the, than the chair really is. So again, you're here in this kind of situation in particular, it's very uh, important to be careful about the, the, the conversation that you have. Okay. Okay, so the miracle worker. A student tells you during a advising session that he expects to, to, to make about a year's progress during the intensive. And let me just make that. It might be that or even more. It might say the student will come in and say that I'm here to write my whole proposal. <laughs> and then that happens. Or they're here to write. Uh, they're going to they're gonna leave with an entire literature review done. And so how do you deal with that? Do we have any uh, input on that one, Scott? Uh, not yet. I th uh, maybe perhaps uh, we have uh, people who are still typing in. Uh, so we'll give you everyone another minute. And also remember, too, sure. you can also click the raise hand button if you want to share your thoughts that way. Oh, okay. We have a hand raised. Uh, Kathleen, go ahead. Um, I think, you know, and I think we all deal with, with students who are unrealistic about time and, and um what I, I found is that you say, okay, let's talk about how you're going to do this and look at the time you have and, you know, how are you going to divide that time up? And um, when I think when the difference between what you'd like to do and what realistically you can do and when you start talking about what you actually you know, st um, can accomplish, and you start uh, allocating what you really, the time you really have in comparison with what you have accomplished in the past, you know, it's, it starts to become a reality check. Yep. Yeah, so it's a, that, that's exactly true. Um, you know, and I think uh, as, as faculty members here, um, you know, either teaching a dissertation intensive or the chairs, you know, the, the residency's office, uh, at least used to, I think they still do contacts the chairs and ahead of time to let them know the students are there. Um, but even the chairs uh, can help with this to just to, to make sure and to, to, to sort of look at where they're at now and to set the right expectation and provide some options to them 
um, in terms of, of what they might accomplish um, while they're there. You know, it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting um, balance between lofty goals and goals that, that are that uh, what they'll actually achieve going out of there. So, great, great, great point. Okay. All right, uh, a couple others wrote in. Um, Maria agrees with Kathleen. Uh, very important to manage expectations without squashing enthusiasm. Uh, yes. So goal setting becomes a no-brainer. Um, uh, Sarah writes in, I would ask the student to review the semester plan and consider feedback time. Do they feel this is truly possible? I would help the student to plot this against a calendar. Great. Yeah, I, you know, and this is this is more of my experience as a as a dissertation chair. Is you know, a student will say, "I want to get my proposal written this term," and then I will ask them, "Okay, go take the calendar and walk backwards." Um, you know, and it's going to take you this long to do this and this long to do this. And and suddenly, when they actually put it on a piece of paper, uh, they begin to see that it's very different, <laughs> and and it, and it helps them to get a more realistic expectation of of what's possible. So I think matching it against some kind of calendar uh, to help bring the reality check in there is very, very important. Okay. And one of the um, things, you know, we used to we used to start the intensives. We used to say we wanted them to to, to um, create a detailed outline. And what we found was that students were coming in in lots of different places, and so we started shifting that message more to um, that we that we want the students to to set goals. That are that are realistic for them, and to share those goals, and that's what we we would do in the first advising session. Is we would really use that opportunity also um, to help them to refine their goals to be more realistic, and then work on them, you know, on the subsequent days that experience. So again, I, I never, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever sat in, a, except for maybe one, sat in a, a capstone intensive where at the end of the day the students said they didn't meet their goals. Okay. But a lot of it, but again, a lot of it was really about re reshifting um, expectations. Okay. Uh, one more thought came in from Melanie. I encourage students to keep up that excellent attitude and then narrow down the conversation. All right. So, what is the first step? She might say. Uh, we begin discussing chapter one or the lit review, and often by day two or day three, the student is focused less on getting it all done and much more excited about getting some of it done. Yes. A a excellent. I'm a psychologist. There's psychology in action. <laughs> <laughs> um, she also adds on, uh, she reminds students, too, that no one can write three chapters or even one chapter in three days and have it be good, clear, and correct. They can, however, write a great first draft during that time, and then they will have something substantial to edit after they leave. I make clear to them that having something to edit instead of sitting in front of a blank screen is a huge step. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great, great answers and suggestions on those, or on that question. Okay, okay so um, I think the, the, the last, or the next to the last slide, let's see, or the last slide is about um, resources. Um, so, so there is a, a Capstone Intensive website that has information um, about the intensives. Uh, it has the intensive calendar. Um, that you can go to. And again, we have them for uh, all of our programs, DBA, EDD, PhD, um, and also for camps. Uh, and I should say doctoral programs, not, not, not um, any capstones at the master's level. Um, so I, I guess uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. I think I've covered um, all the, the key parts of it. Uh, you know, I think I'll just end and then open it up for general questions. I'll just end to say that, that this was always one of my favorite experiences, residency type experiences uh, at Walden. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel pretty well versed in, in the different methodologies, but I love working with students at this, at this very creative stage. And, and not to say that I wasn't frustrated sometimes, and I usually, I usually came home from that on Sunday. I was pretty tired um, because it is, a, it is emotionally exhausting. Uh, kind of time, but it, but also just a time of uh, immense and intense creativity, uh, and and the ability to sort of share uh, ideas and and to to write ideas and and for me it's all about learning uh, content and, and 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 things that people are researching that in my own discipline I would never even think of or never have insight into. So it's uh, I, I always find these things are just as rewarding for me. Um, as they are for the students. So it's a, it's a great experience. 
Um, you know, if you, I don't know if, if people are on here because they're considering teaching them, it's a great teaching um, resource, but also it's a wonderful resource to encourage your students to attend. So I guess at that, I'll just, uh, I don't know if, um, uh, if Scott or anybody on the residency team, if you had anything that you wanted to add and, and then just open it up for questions. Okay. Um, nothing to add at this point, but uh, while you're, if you uh, don't have any additional questions and you're, while we're waiting for others to type in their questions, um, well, I have put the link uh, to the feedback survey in the uh, questions area, so you can uh, start on that uh, while we're seeing if any questions come in. Um, and I'm just hearing from our uh, residency team, uh, looks like there's no additional um, addition, additions or anything at this point. Okay. Okay, and we'll just pause one more moment to see if there's any additional questions. Okay, looks like uh, no additional questions, Gary. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, this was uh, great to be able to share this experience with you, and um, have a good uh, rest of the day. Yep, and thank you, Gary, very much for working with us and putting this together and for, for being our presenter. Um, as follow-up today, we will send out the PowerPoint presentation and a link to the recording in case you missed anything or want to revisit any of the content. And we'll also include the feedback survey uh, in case you didn't get an opportunity to complete that before you left. So uh, thank you again, uh, Gary, and for those of you who attended today. Uh, and this concludes our webinar for now. Goodbye for now, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.